I'm Jeffrey Rosen. I am the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and I've been here for about a year and a half since June 2013. It was striking and significant that the Chief Justice said in a recent speech, don't cite the Magna Carta before the Supreme Court. And other justices have said things like, don't cite the Declaration of Independence because it's not the Constitution. What I find so exciting about displaying the original documents, and also this incredible interactive that I showed you earlier, which allows folks online to trace the evolution of rights from the revolutionary state constitutions through the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution to the Bill of Rights, is that you see the continuities of these documents and the evolution of their ideas. The, although the Chief Justice is certainly right that you wouldn't cite the Magna Carta as legal authority, it's also the case that Article 39 of the Magna Carta became the basis for our Due Process Clause. And it's also the case that our Due Process Clause wasn't created out of thin air, but was essentially cut and paste from the Due Process Clauses that appeared in the colonial charters, and then in the revolutionary state constitutions, and then ultimately were uh, signaled in the Declaration and codified in the Bill of Rights. I have behind me, I think I can just turn around and see it. I don't know if it's in the camera range, but there are two books um, that I used a lot in law school, Benjamin Schwartz, great collection about the documentary sources of the Bill of Rights. And he starts with Magna Carta, includes the colonial charters, then the revolutionary state constitutions, then the debates over the Constitution and Bill of Rights. And I got a sense from that collection how intertwined the documents were and how there really was an evolution in rights and how much consensus there was at the time of the framing that people had certain basic rights. They were either unalienable rights, natural rights that came from God and not government, or the common law rights of Englishmen, like the Magna Carta rights and rights of trial by jury and habeas corpus, and how consistently those rights evolved in the pre-revolutionary charters, so that when Madison came to draft the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, he was synthesizing rather than creating. Jefferson also wasn't an original thinker in writing the Declaration. He's the most gorgeous uh, writer and most important constitutional philosopher in American history, but he was essentially cutting and pasting from George Mason's Declaration. So that's why I think this interactive is so incredibly valuable. Basically what Zach Elkins from the University of Texas and the Constitute website and I tried to do is put online all of the documents that are in that Schwartz book and allow people to access them so they can see visually and thematically the evolution of rights. So that's a long way of saying it's really important to learn about our constitutional history and the antecedent documents, not only because it's really interesting and illuminating as a citizen, but if you want to understand the meaning of the due process clause today, you can't understand it without knowing something about the Magna Carta. If you want to know the sources of the uh, of, of the First Amendment's uh, guarantees of religious liberty. You need to understand the natural law theories on which the framers relied or uh, the Article V Amendment process. You have to understand how they believed fundamentally that the right to alter and abolish government was the cornerstone of all other natural rights. Um, that's why for me this is not only history, although I think very passionately that learning history for its own sake is really important for American citizens of all ages. This is what, what defines who we are as Americans. But it's also important if you're going to understand current debates, because there is such a continuity among these documents. The Chief Justice is not a doctrinaire originalist. So I think, for example, Justice Scalia or Justice Thomas might be more receptive to arguments about the Magna Carta than the Chief Justice is. But I think that he was making a point about institutional competence, that it's important to understand history for its own sake, but if you're going to argue before the Supreme Court, you should make legal points, and legal points are most uh, helpfully rooted in the totemic documents themselves, that is the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Still, I, I won't, won't try to channel him, but uh, as a, in, in his incredibly thoughtful opinions, he's deeply interested in constitutional history. Uh, he's studied and written about it, and he knows uh, better than all of us just how intertwined these documents are. So I, th I think it's a reminder that studying history is important for its own sake, 
But if you're going to make legal arguments, make sure that you tie them to concrete legal sources. There is no substitute for the thrill of seeing an original founding document in person and up close. It's great to look at stuff online. I think our website is phenomenal. I love our podcast. You could tell how excited I am about Rights Interactive, which lets you trace the documentary sources of the Bill of Rights. But actually to stand before one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights to see John Adams's uh, distinctive signature um, is irreplaceable. To see the first public printing of the Constitution you, um, is an incredible civic experience. And it is a living document, Not, I'm not making an interpretive claim, but just to think that this is the document that we, the people of the United States, saw for the first time to imagine them clamoring to read and touch the first public printing of the Constitution and to debate it, connects these incredibly important constitutional and legal debates to physical artifacts in a way that connects us to the past. So that's why I'm passionate about all aspects of our educational mission. This is an educational institution, uh, not only a museum. Uh, the museum is just one function of our educational mission. But the museum, part of it, is really important because it's the most tangible way of connecting to the past. That's why people flock to the National Archives. That's why I'm so excited that we are, uh, my understanding is one of the only institutions in America, aside from the National Archives, at the moment to have rare copies of all three founding documents in one place. I think that's what motivates incredibly generous philanthropists like David Rubenstein to loan us copies of the Declaration of Independence and the 13th Amendment. He's talked very persuasively about how important it is for citizens to see the documents up close. He's loaned the Magna Carta to the Library of Congress. I think that's an incredible patriotic service. So there's a big debate nowadays about the future of museums in a world of online experiences. Should stuff be interactive? Is there still an audience for in-person interaction with artifacts? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that from a constitutional point of view, there really is no substitute for seeing the documents up close and personal. It connects us to the past more dramatically than anything else. I'm a teacher of the Constitution, and the National Constitution Center is an educational institution. We have an obligation to tell the stories behind the constitutional amendments, the historic stories, so that citizens understand what were the controversies that gave them life, and it's only by understanding those stories that they can make up their own minds about their current applications. So let me give the example of the Fourth Amendment. You can't understand its contemporary significance or make up your mind about what that significance should be without knowing the stories of the general warrants and the writs of assistance that inflame the framers. And that's why in our Bill of Rights gallery, you'll learn that the paradigmatic example of an unreasonable search and seizure that upset the American framers were the hated uh, writs of assistance that allowed the Crown to try to enforce the hated tax laws in Boston. And we note in the exhibit that James Otis gave a famous speech denouncing the writs of assistance. He said they put the liberty of every man at the discretion of a petty officer. And John Adams said of Otis's speech, at that moment, the child independence was born. Why is it important to know that story? Well, Chief Justice John Roberts told that story himself in his inspiring nine to zero opinion in the Riley case saying that the cops can't search my cell phone without a warrant if they arrest me. Here's my cell phone. Uh, it has my life in it. You can read all my emails and see my pictures and all my thoughts and uh, electronic data is contained here. And Chief Justice Roberts compared the search of a cell phone to the hated uh, general warrants and writs of assistance that inflamed the American Revolution and noted that when the framers talked about prohibiting unreasonable searches and seizures of our persons, houses, papers, and effects, they insisted on particular description of those searches to avoid the evils of the James Otis denounced. So this is living history. And again, you don't have to be 
you can decide whether you're an originalist, that is someone who thinks the Constitution should be interpreted primarily in light of its original understanding, or you prefer a more expansive living constitutional approach. Whatever approach you take, it's relevant to know the history. Um, Ronald Dworkin, the former, the late uh, great liberal constitutional scholar, an advocate of living constitutionalism, said we're all originalists now in the sense of recognizing the relevance of the history. And you just can't, to, to read those words in isolation, uh, you won't be able to make an informed decision about them. I also want to tell the story, and we'll find ways to tell it um, when creating our interactive constitution, about John Wilkes, the British mischief maker and rogue who denounced, who wrote an anonymous pamphlet accusing uh, the king's mother of having an affair with the foreign secretary. This understandably infuriated King George. He issued a general warrant basically authorizing his agents to identify the author of this anonymous pamphlet. They broke into lots of people's houses. They identified Wilkes as the author of the pamphlet, North Britain 45. He sued and said that the general warrant was invalid because it didn't particularly specify the place to be searched or the thing to be seized. And a court presided over by Lord Camden uh, agreed and said that the common law rights of English men prohibited general searches without individualized suspicion. So that story, it was Wilkes's papers and Wilkes's effects that the framers were thinking about when they wrote the Fourth Amendment. That story is immortalized in towns and children from Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, to Camden, New Jersey, to John Wilkes Booth. And it's important for citizens to know these stories. It's also a teaching tool because you can't connect to the Constitution without stories. You need to know the human stories that excited and inflamed the framers. So that's why I believe very passionately that history is relevant uh, as a way of engaging citizens and that it's necessary if you're going to make informed decisions about the Constitution. The Supreme Court cites these stories and I really believe strongly there are good arguments on all sides of constitutional issues. There are very few questions that get to the Supreme Court where I think the answer is clear. And when someone says to me, this, the Constitution clearly requires this, I you know, reach for my wallet, or more importantly, for my, I'm now taking out lots of props, but my pocket Constitution, which of course is produced by the National Constitution Center, check in to our website. I think these are going to be on Amazon soon for like a dollar, so they're really cheap. Or if you email me, maybe I can send you one. But it, it's a great way, it's a great thing to carry around with you at all times, so that when someone says the Constitution clearly requires, you can take out your pocket Constitution, read the text, and start debating it. But in order to debate it thoughtfully and in an informed way, you're going to have to educate yourself about these paradigm cases, these historical examples that excited the framers. And uh, the Constitution Center is a good place to come. If you buy the latest edition, or if I give it to you, which I'd love to do, you can read this riveting essay by me and David Rubenstein, which talks about the relationship between the three documents, the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, which is the clever and unexpected title that we've given to our essay. And it's just a couple pages long. You can just download it free online without going to Amazon. We're trying to tell the story of the relation between the three documents. It's an example of how I think to understand the Constitution, you have to engage with the ideas, but you also have to delve into the historical controversies that gave them life.